Well, good morning. This is uh, MacArthur Baptist Church, and uh, we are glad that uh, you've uh, viewed in online, as uh, we have our online services during this COVID lockdown uh, here in Australia and Sydney. And uh, I know that uh, there's uh, been a few people who've been in hospital this week, and uh, so uh, we've had a busy week that way. Uh, it's good to hear about uh, Pastor Sini and how his platelet level has come up. Uh, please continue to pray for him. And uh, also Ivy uh, uh, has gone into hospital. I, I think she's having an operation either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, or Sorry, either I'm, I'm speaking from Saturday night. So uh, she may be having it today, Sunday, uh, or else... Uh, Possibly last night. So, uh, any case, um, it. I trust that you've had a good week, and uh, that you're looking forward to uh, what we have to share this morning. Uh, I'm going to be speaking this morning about a call to collaboration. A call to collaboration. We're going to go to Genesis chapter six, and we're going to read uh, from verse twelve, and uh, we're going to read down to the end of the chapter. It says. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive, and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Let's just go to the Lord in, in prayer, shall we? Father, we give you praise and thanks, Lord, for your goodness and uh, your faithfulness, Lord, during this week. We're thankful for answered prayer uh, for those who have been sick and who have been in hospital, uh, for the different ones who uh, have just uh, various different needs and, and just the amazing way, Lord, that uh, you're able to meet those needs. Uh, we're thankful, Lord, that even in this time of lockdown, that, uh, Lord, you can uh, minister to our hearts in a special way. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would help us as a church. Uh, we just pray that uh, your grace would be upon uh, each one that is a member of our church, that is a regular at our church. We ask, Father, that uh, you would uh, help each one uh, Lord, uh, we pray about this lockdown that the numbers of uh, people contracting COVID would go down and that, uh, Lord, again, we'd be able to return to some form of uh, normalcy, we pray. And so, Lord, we commit this message to you. We pray, uh, Lord, that you would um, bless the preaching of your word and also, Lord, help me uh, now to, uh, to speak as you would have me to speak and that, Lord, uh, we might uh, have understanding, uh, Lord, as uh, we go through this passage of Scripture today. We pray that you challenge our hearts, Father, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, in the world of American 
sports. Uh, in American basketball, on one occasion, Chicago Bulls rookie forward, a man by the name of Stacy King, scored. He scored one point uh, in a game in which Michael Jordan, the very famous basketball player, had scored 69 points. And then, after in an interview with the young rookie, uh, uh, asking about his performance and what he felt about uh, uh, the, his performance in this winning game. Uh, King said, I'll always remember this as the night that Michael Jordan and I combined to score 70 points. <laughs> uh, that kind of reminds me of what we're reading today with Noah uh, and God's call to collaborate with him in order to rescue Noah and his family and then two of every species of animal that uh, was upon the earth from the great deluge or the great flood uh, that would come to destroy the earth. Now, of course, if you're wondering what that word collaboration means, and I understand that uh, in some areas, uh, for example, in teaching, collaboration is a, is a word which is uh, very familiar, a very familiar term, uh, but in other areas it may not be something which is as well known. So another word for collaboration basically is teamwork. Uh, or working together uh, and really Noah had been invited by God here in this passage of scripture to labor uh, together with him to be a co-laborer with God and as we're introduced to this passage uh, in verse 12 uh, we first of all see that mankind uh, as we've seen in the weeks before uh, had become corrupted and uh, was condemned in the sight of God it says, uh, verse 12 and 13, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Uh, very sad words, really, when we think of that situation that within a fairly short span of time of 10 generations man had gone from a couple who uh, spent their time enjoying the presence of God in the garden paradise of Eden to now a conniving, a conniving multitude of people whose pleasure was in being independent of God's presence and uh, who sought who actively sought every opportunity to hurt or murder or kill uh, others in a world that was overflowing with violence we're told and so as they destroyed life as mankind destroyed life uh, so God would also destroy them uh, in a just judgment and so as we saw last week <clears throat> and the week before that uh, we saw that uh, God uh, had a special favor towards Noah the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this meant, of course, that God was going to bless Noah in a special way when his intent on the rest of the world was to curse the world. And so we, we see some things in this passage that I trust uh, will be a blessing and perhaps a challenge uh, to you as we study this together. The first is this. Uh, we see, first of all, what a contrast there is between the words them and thee them and thee we're told that the earth is filled with violence through them and behold or listen listen i will destroy them with the earth that's a, the the pronoun them is referring to all the people on the earth uh and then a little further down we find in verse 18 uh that uh, it says this it says but with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons wives with thee as well as every living thing and uh, it goes on to say to keep them alive with thee so what a contrast we see here between them and thee God is making a special covenant with Noah who is referred to in verse 18 as thee and uh, not only thee but also 
vine. Thy, uh, it says, thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives uh, with thee, of every living thing, of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. Okay? Uh, and so God would destroy them, but deliver thee and thine. Praise God that Noah decided that just because it was bad all around, it didn't mean that he had to go the same way. Uh, we need people to today like Noah, uh, who will live for God when everyone else won't. Instead of uh, just following the crowd, uh, the crowd were destroyed, but Noah was delivered. And so uh, Noah uh, had the foresight to follow God and uh, not to follow the crowd because the crowd was going to uh, his, was going to be temporary uh, and uh, have temporary popularity, if you like, whereas uh, God was going to have everlasting uh, popularity. So um, because Noah wanted to please God, we see secondly that God took Noah into his confidence. Again, uh, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13, it says, And God said unto Noah. God said unto Noah. That's amazing, isn't it? That God communicated with Noah, the one who created the stars, the planets, the universe, uh, the microorganisms, the, uh, the atom, all those things that this great God communicated with Noah personally and shared with him uh, what his plan was uh, for the world, uh, what he was going to do with the world, and also, uh, very importantly, what uh, God planned uh, for Noah to do alongside uh, his family uh, in the carrying out of that plan. Uh, you know, the Bible says in Psalm 25, verse 14, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. You know, that verse is fulfilled in exactly in this passage of Scripture uh, where God uh, shares his secret with Noah. And then and we'll see a little bit later on in the passage how he shares with him his covenant. That's exactly what God did with Noah. And we discover that, that God was very specific in showing, uh, showing what Noah was to do in those plans that he had for the world. And God will be very specific in also showing you what his will is uh, for your life. If you intend to build something for God, whether that's a, uh, a marriage or whether that's a career or whether it's uh, a family or whether it's a church or church ministry, uh, God will be very specific in leading you and guiding you uh, in that pursuit. Some Christians, in fact, even some Christian leaders and pastors, Think that God is not really interested in showing you specifically what his will is for your life. Uh, I've heard pastors say, if God calls you to start a church, then go to a place that you like and start one there. Uh, if you like the Gold Coast, then go to the Gold Coast and start a church. Because God isn't uh, as concerned about where you, go, where you go as he is that you go. Well... I don't believe that's true. Uh, as we study Scripture, I believe it's very uh, clear from Scripture that God is very specific in revealing His will about what He wants us to do, uh, where He wants us to go, uh, where we're to do it, uh, when we're to do it, why we, we ought to do it, uh, and how we should do it as well. Uh, we see that uh, uh, God confides in Noah, in these ways uh, and, and he will also as you seek to do his will he will confide in you and communicate his will to you in the same way he'll tell you what to do when to do it where to do it why you ought to do it and how you should do it uh, we see for example in this passage that God told Noah what he wanted him to do in verse 14 uh, of uh, Genesis chapter 6 it says Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Uh, so we see that God told Noah what he wanted him to do. 
God told him when he wanted to do it. If we go back to verse 3, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. That is, a hundred and twenty years until they board the ark. So uh, God had a, a time that uh, needed to be punctually met by Noah, uh, and so God had a plan for the timing. Uh, of the building of the ark. We also see that God told him why he ought to build the ark. Verse 13 says that the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I destroy them with the earth. And then if we go down to verse 17, it says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Uh, but with thee will I establish my covenant. And, and so it goes on there. But we see that there was a reason here why God was having Noah uh, build this ark. And then uh, as well as that, it tells him how. Uh, God tells him how to build the ark. It goes on in verse 15 and 16 to say, And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be... 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in, in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. So this is a very specific instruction about what uh, Noah is to do. The only thing, the only uh, one of those uh, that is not specifically mentioned in chapter 6 is where uh, to to do his will. Uh, and yet, as we study scripture, as we look and compare scripture with scripture, we find that there are other places uh, in scripture where this is the case, where it's very uh, specific that uh, uh, God God's people was uh, were to serve God in specific places. Uh, for example, in Acts chapter 16, uh, we read in verse uh, 6 through to 10, it says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, that is in Turkey, uh, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not, or the Spirit of God didn't allow them to go to Bithynia at that particular time. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And so it's not that God was not interested or did not love the people of Turkey or the people of Bithynia, but at that particular time it was not God's will that Paul go to those places. Later on, of course, we know that uh, in Turkey, there was quite a number of churches that Paul established uh, and started and uh, that he wrote letters to. Uh, and so we know that God eventually led him to Turkey. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we see here that uh, God specifically leads us to places uh, as well as uh, telling us what we're to do. So God will show you specifically Things like who, who you should marry if you're single, uh, what job you should do, what church you should be in, uh, all those sorts of things, because God is a God of specifics. He is a God of specificity. That's a, a good word, isn't it? Specificity. Uh, I remember when I was in Mildura, uh, there was a time I, uh, I uh, was working at a school there as a teacher's aide, and uh, while I was there, I was uh, doing my education course uh, and got my teaching course, uh, teaching degree. And uh, yet, uh, because of different circumstances at that school, uh, I didn't get a renewal of contract. And so I was out of work for about six months trying to get work in Mildura so that we can continue the ministry there. But it just seemed as if God closed the door uh, on Mildura as far as staying there and then we began to look elsewhere and I began to apply for 
for various different jobs. I'd, I'd written 110 job applications and just was unable to to get any work in Mildura. So uh, I wrote to a place in Melbourne and they asked me to come down for an interview. I went and had an interview and uh, they asked me to come back for a second interview, which is usually very uh, promising. But because we'd have to move from Mildura to Melbourne, I remember sitting in the car with my wife and we were discussing the matter and uh, she said, oh, we really need to know uh, that this is God's will, that this is the, the specific job that God wants for you. And I said to her, uh, well, what do you think, how do you think the Lord can conform, com, confirm that this is the, the job that uh, he wants for us? And uh, she said, well, uh, the job uh, has a range of pay, uh, depending on experience. It ranged from 40000 per annum to 60000 And she said, let's ask the Lord that if this is the job uh, that you should have, that you would get the $60,000 pay packet. And I said, well, honey, I said, maybe that's a bit unreasonable because, uh, you know, I haven't had a lot of experience in administration. It was an administration job that I was going for rather than a teaching job. And uh, so she said, well, let's let's pray about it. Let's trust the Lord if that's the if this is the place that uh, we are to go to. And then I said, uh, so what other way uh, should we look for confirmation? And she said, well, uh, let's ask the Lord to give you an ongoing contract. And I said, honey, I've worked in education long enough to know that uh, in education, uh, people that are new, that are coming into the school, they're never given an ongoing contract. They might be given a six month contract or a yearly, con you know, a year long contract. Uh, and then that's renewed after a while, um, but never an ongoing contract. And so she said, well, let's just see if the Lord will do that. And so we prayed about it. And then I went back for my second interview and they said to me, uh, OK, we're, we're very happy with uh, uh, with what you've shown us. And uh, we believe that you can do this job uh, that we're wanting you to do. And they said, have you got any questions? And I said, well, first of all, uh, what will be the pay? And they said, well, you're you've got teaching degree. So uh, you'll be paid a teacher's wage, which at that stage, a beginning teacher. Uh, was sixty-one thousand uh, dollars per annum, and uh, so it wasn't between forty or sixty, but it was actually more than that by a thousand dollars. And uh, so I thought, oh, okay, then I wasn't expecting that. And then uh, for an administration job, and then uh, secondly, I said, and um, what sort of contract will I be be put on to? Will I get a six-month contract or a, a year-long contract? Uh, what sort of contract will you put me on? And they said, oh, ongoing. Uh, we'll give you an ongoing contract. I just could not help but just burst out <laughs> with a big smile on my face because I knew that this was God confirming to me that this was the place that he wanted us to do, uh, wanted me to be. So, yes, God can do that. God can, uh, he can show us uh, where he wants us to be and he can be very specific about that. I remember one time uh, the Lord directed us to Albany, Western Australia. And I remember someone saying to me, how can you know so sure that you're meant to be in Albany? There's no mention of the word Albany in the Bible. How do you know? And yet it was very, very clear that God very clearly, in fact, it was just so clear. It's amazing uh, that he directed us to Albany. Uh, at that particular time. And so uh, God is very specific in his direction. Thirdly, we see that God cho uh, chose to collaborate with man. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 to 9 says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every one shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. What an awesome concept that is. When it comes to salvation, of course, uh, God does the whole work. 
Uh, it's through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ in him alone that we can receive salvation. All we have to do is receive it by faith. Uh, the complete work of paying for our sins and the forgiveness of sins is done by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and through the empty tomb, through his resurrection. Uh, and so uh, that is not a collaborative work. Salvation is not a collaborative work. I remember reading about a pastor who was interviewing a young man who was applying for membership in a church. And so he asked, uh, you know, the normal questions, uh, how did you get saved? And uh, the boy answered, well, God did his part and I did my part. Well, that's not, the good, that's not a good answer uh, to give to a pastor when you're speaking about salvation. And so he was a bit concerned with that answer. And so he asked him to explain a little bit further what he meant uh, by uh, God did his part and I did my part. And so the boy explained what he meant uh, by that answer. He said, God did the part of saving and I did the part of sinning. I ran from God as fast as I could and God came after me until he finally ran me down. Well, that's salvation, isn't it? Uh, and uh, so as far as collaboration is concerned there, uh, God is the one who saves us. He's the one. Uh, if, we, if we try to collaborate by you know, earning our salvation in any way, uh, then we've fallen from the grace of God, the Bible says. So that's salvation. But uh, when it comes to building a work for God, uh, then God does an amazing thing. Uh, he desires to collaborate with us. And now it's, it's uh, true that when it comes to a work of God, building a work of God, God does certain things uh, and things which we cannot do. And then we are responsible for doing certain things as well. In Noah's time, we find that God was responsible to bring the worldwide flood. God says in verse 17, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Only God could do that. Man could not manipulate that. He couldn't go out and do a rain dance or something like that and manipulate the clouds to come together and uh, for it to rain. And certainly this was more than just a, a little sprinkle in one particular area. This was a worldwide flood. Only God could do that. And then secondly, God showed Noah the design uh, for this ark. In verse 14 to 16, God specifically goes through and gives him instructions about how he is to build this ark. Uh, and it's interesting, engineers, modern engineers have looked at the uh, various different dimensions of the ark and they say that it's uh, the, the dimensions of the safest uh, vessel in, in a seagoing, uh, seagoing uh, sort of uh, uh, setting. Uh, and so uh, in, in rough stormy seas, uh, it's the most stable dimensions that you can find for a ship. That's interesting. Um, but we see that it's because God was the designer. He was the architect of the ark. And then uh, when everyone was on board, uh, the Bible tells us a little bit later on that it was God who shut the door. In chapter 7 and verse 16, it says, And they that went in, went in, male and female, of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And so it was the Lord who shut the door. And that's interesting as well because uh, it shows that God and only God is the one who uh, makes the decision when mercy has been exhausted. It's not up to us to say that guy's just too far gone. We, he'll never get saved. You know, uh, God can do amazing things in people's hearts. And we can be surprised that people we don't think will ever get saved suddenly get saved. Uh, and so we should never give up on people. It's up to God uh, as he's the one who knows when his mercy has been exhausted. Uh, now, he could have just, um, as far as the ark was concerned, as far as the work of uh, Noah was concerned, God could have, he could have just uh, spoken an ark into existence and said, here, Noah, get on board this ark, you and your family and all these animals, and, uh, and I'll rescue you that way. But that's not what God chose to do. 
Uh, he gave Noah a work to do, just as he gives us a work to do uh, in reaching people for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we are responsible to not just pray for the lost, but to go uh, and give out the gospel, not for our salvation, but for their salvation. Uh, and so that's important. God uh, could have sent his angels uh, with a message to tell the world of how the Lord Jesus Christ had died on the cross of Calvary and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, that he died and that he rose again the third day, uh, giving power to as many as would believe on him. But God didn't choose, he didn't select the angels to go around the world with that message. He gave that message to fallen man who'd been saved by grace. And that's you and me. And so God chose to do a work, but he chose not to do it without man. This was the case in Noah's day. This is the case today. And then <clears throat> fourthly, we see that God made a covenant with Noah that was accompanied by some commands. Uh, in verse 18, it says, But with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons wives with thee and then it goes through for the rest of the chapter it goes through and it talks about the responsibilities that noah was to to do and then it finishes off in verse 22 and says thus did noah according to all that god commanded him so did he now a covenant. God wanted to establish his covenant with Noah. This is the first time in the Bible that the word covenant is used. It's a very important biblical word. And basically a covenant has been defined as an arrangement that involves obligations and benefits for the parties involved. In this particular covenant, God obliges himself and Noah gets the benefits. God says that he is going to flood the world. Uh, he doesn't say he's going to flood the world if something happens or Noah does something or the other people do something or don't do something. He says he's going to flood the, flood the world. But he is going to save Noah and he's going to save his family and he's going to save two of every creature uh, that have been created to... to, to uh, uh, go on the ark and so this is something that God obligates himself to do and of course Noah is going to experience the benefit of that in scripture we find that there are two types of covenants there's the unconditional covenant where God says that he's going to do a certain thing and it's not dependent on anything that we do um, he says that he's going to do it and he's going to do it the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this the Bible says. Uh, and then there's uh, conditional covenants where God says, I want to bless you um, and I will bless you if you obey me in this area or the, in doing these things. Uh, and uh, in Scripture, there are also uh, promises that we find in the Word of God which are similar to these covenants in that there are some that are unconditional promises and some that are conditional Promises. We need to be able to discern whether they're conditional or unconditional uh, when we want to claim those verses or when we want to latch onto those verses as some sort of comfort when we're maybe going through uh, some difficulty uh, in our hearts. Uh, for example, our eternal security is like the unconditional covenant. There's promises in relation to our eternal security, the fact that we are kept by the power of God, the fact that we cannot be unborn again, the fact that we are kept in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the hand of the Father and uh, n nothing that we do can uh, open that hand which keeps us uh, secure. So our eternal security and many promises in relation to our eternal security, uh, they speak of unconditional uh, promises. God has promised that he will save us that heaven is our home, that our sins have been forgiven, they'll never be mentioned again. Uh, praise God for that. But then there are also some promises, uh, and promises for the Christian life, uh, that are conditional promises. And we need to be aware of those. 
Uh, for example, Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Is that a conditional or an unconditional promise? Well, if you look at the context of that uh, passage, uh, we find that Paul was commending the very generous spirit of the Philippians who had supported him uh, in, in missionary endeavor and had also uh, sought to give towards the needs of others. And then he comforts their concerns uh, about whether or not they've given too much, whether or not uh, they're going to be able to make it now that they've given so much money. Uh, he says, listen, he said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So uh, there is a sense in which this is a not something that you just uh, <clears throat> you know claim uh, willy-nilly, so to speak. It's, it's something that is based on the fact of being a faithful giver and learning the grace of giving. As we learn the grace of giving, there are accompanying rewards uh, that God gives uh, for those who are grace givers. Uh, and so the benefits uh, that this covenant with God will bring uh, to Noah is that he and his family will survive the destruction and that each species of animal will be preserved to start all over again once the flood subsides. Uh, in the new world that um, uh, will exist uh, after the flood. <clears throat> but the responsibilities that we see that Noah uh, is expected to do are as follows. First of all, he must construct the ark in preparation for the flood. Uh, we saw that in uh, chapter 6, verse 14, uh, and so on. And we see, secondly, that his work needed to conform to God's formula. It says in verse 15, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. He had to uh, make the ark according to the, uh, the measurements that God gave to him. Uh, earlier than that, we see that not only the measurements, but the materials uh, also had to uh, be strictly abided by. We see in verse 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. So we see that uh, his uh, work, Noah's work, as he sought to construct the ark, needed to conform to God's formula. Uh, and of course we always run into trouble when building a work for God, when we stray from the formulas that we find written in God's word for how we are to build a work of God, whether it's a marriage, uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, living for God, uh, being a, a, a Christian, uh, whether it's uh, some sort of church work, whether it's a ministry, uh, whether it's our finances, how we handle our finances, doing a, a work for God as far as honoring the Lord in our finances, uh, all those different things. Once we stray from God's formulas that are written down in his word, then we find ourselves getting into trouble. And so we find that Noah was to build an ark, first of all, from gopher wood. He wasn't to use balsa wood or some other weaker form of, uh, of wood. It needed to be, first of all, a solid work. And of course, if we're going to build a work for God, it has to be a solid work. It can't necessarily be something that happens overnight. Uh, we need to put some time into it and some patience into it, uh, some diligence into it uh, in order for it to be a solid work. And then secondly, it needed to be a sealed work. We find that Noah had to apply the pitch uh, inside and outside of the, the ark. Uh, the wood itself, uh, those wooden beams, were not good enough to keep <coughs> the ark from leaking. Uh, water would come in. So they had to put a sealant uh, throughout the ship, throughout the ark, uh, and uh, make sure that the water uh, wouldn't find itself getting in. Now, uh, the problem with the church today is not that the church is in the world. We have to be in the world if we're going to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to reach the world for Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, 
God so loved the world and we're in the world in order to reach the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. So the problem is not that the church is in the world, uh, just the same as the, uh, there was not a problem that the ark would be in the floods, in the floodwaters, um, because they would be, the, the people inside and the animals inside would be safe. The problem today is when the, when the wor world gets into the church, when the world gets into the church, uh, just as the problem would be water getting into the ark. And that's why it needed the pitch within and without had to be a sealed work. When we allow the, the rubbish of this world system uh, to get in to the church or to get into our lives, uh, then we find that it dampens our spirits. We find that it drowns uh, our enthusiasm uh, for God and we find ourselves straying away, uh, living by lesser priorities and uh, really wasting uh, our lives for God. Thirdly, it needed to be a work that needed to be of the right size. Verse 15 uh, tells us uh, there, um, it said it had to be uh, 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. Now scientists say that the ark was large enough to fit 400 railway carriages of livestock in it. That's approximately 125,000 animals. Uh, the ark was a three-story zoo that was approximately 140 meters long, 25 meters wide, and 20 meters uh, high. And so it was a big work for a big need. Uh, but not every work of God is, not, is going to be uh, is going to necessarily be a supersized ministry. I remember once having a very enthusiastic Sunday school superintendent who uh, used to look after our Sunday schools, who used to direct the, the teachers and make sure they had curriculum and all that sort of thing. And uh, he'd been listening to a series uh, put out by a, uh, a, a very uh, uh, soul-winning uh, college in the United States and uh, he'd been listening to a series called Super Aggressive Bus Ministry. And uh, he came to me one day and he said, Now, Pastor, he said, I've been listening to this series on Super Aggressive Bus Ministry and we really need to get more uh, kids under the sound of the gospel. He said, Pastor, we need to hire a big bus, a big bus, just like the buses uh, that take people places, you know, that they see on the street not one of these little van things, but a full-size bus. We need to hire one of those big buses so that we can get more uh, students into our Sunday school. And so it just happened to be that we had a couple of, uh, um, people, a couple of men in the church who were professional bus drivers. I think we had two or three. And we spoke to them and uh, we, we found out that they were agreeable to, uh, you know, going out a bit earlier and collecting kids uh, on a bus run uh, in a big bus and then uh, also um, taking them home after the service and, and that sort of thing. And then we did uh, some uh, inquiries with the council. We managed to, to hire a full-size bus. And so everyone was excited. People went out and invited uh, people to come along to our Sunday school. And so the following week, we actually filled that big bus we had uh, more than 50 kids, 50 new students come along to our Sunday school. And so uh, that su Sunday school superintendent, he was excited about that. He was an excited man anyway, but he, he was really excited about that. And uh, I, I, the thing was, though, that I began to get complaints from the Sunday school teachers as week after week we, we have these big buses turn up with loads of kids. And uh, they said, Pastor, we're just having a real problem uh, keeping these kids under control. They're not as obedient as the other kids. They haven't learned to sit and listen in Sunday school class. And we're having all sorts of problems. We, we don't have a lot of room for them. In fact, we're, we're really overcrowded and uh, we just don't know what to do. We need more volunteers to come into our classes to help with behavior management and we need to you know, we need uh, others to just to help out in every class. And so that was a good problem to have, of course. But um, 
any case, uh, the, the Sunday school superintendent came up to me about a week later and he said, uh, Pastor, he said, you know, it worked really well. We got so many kids uh, come out in this big bus. And he said, uh, uh, our next step is we need to get, we need to hire 20 big buses and bring a whole bunch of kids uh, along to the, uh, the Sunday school. And I had to say to that man, uh, look, we can't. We just can't. We don't have the resources to be able to handle that many kids. We wouldn't have a whole lot of people hearing the gospel. Uh, we would have an undisciplined rabble uh, that are just making all sorts of trouble uh, and make it very difficult for the, uh, the Sunday school teachers. So uh, we just didn't have the resources. We didn't have the room. We didn't have the number of teachers to handle all that many uh, kids coming along. So we do want growth. We do want to reach people uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, but we need to be able to accommodate that growth or else we'll just be an unorganized rabble of people uh, that are not learning, they're not listening, uh, they're just uh, making a nuisance uh, of themselves and distracting others from really learning the things of God uh, that they need to be learning. Uh, so we, a work of God needs to have the right size, okay? And that will be determined by the Lord as, as we're faithful to seek to, to uh, live for Him and to follow His direction. And then fourthly, it needs to be a self-effacing work. Uh, verse 16, it tells us that a window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And so we see there that the window was just a small window, uh, it was just a cubit square. A cubit is approximately 46 centimeters, so it was 46 centimeters square. But it gave those inside just enough of an idea of what was going on on the outside. It would remind them that were it not for the grace of God, that that would have been us out there in the flood, in the deluge. It would keep them from complacency. And it would remind them to be grateful for God's mercies. So a, a work of God needs to be a self-effacing uh, work. It needs to be a humble work, in other words. One that is grateful to God for what he has done for us, as undeserving as we are. And then fifthly, it needs to be a work that seeks the lost. Uh, a door was set down in the side of the ark, the Bible says, not high up, out of reach, uh, but accessible to whosoever will that may want to come aboard uh, at the preaching of Noah and perhaps of his sons and, and family members. Peter tells us that, after all, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Uh, and as he built for 120 years, he also pleaded with people to, to heed the warning uh, of, of uh, coming judgment and to come into the ark for their safety. Even though they didn't respond to the offer of salvation, it's better to have gone into perdition, into damnation, for refusing the offer they've heard than to go into damnation not ever hearing the message of salvation. Noah also had some other responsibilities we read about other than building the ark. Uh, he, first of all, or he needed to conduct his family onto the ark it tells us in verse 18 uh, there, but with thee will I establish my covenant. Thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives are with thee. Then they needed to count and corral the fauna in the ark. In verse 19 and 20, it says, and of, of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, of cattle after their kind, of creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And then he needed another responsibilities. He needed to collect food for all that were on the ark to eat. In verse 21, it says, And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee, and for them, for the animals, in other words. And then finally, 
uh, after we read all about uh, uh, Noah's expectations, the things that the responsibilities, the obligations that Noah had uh, as he prepared for this cataclysmic event, we read of God's commendation of Noah. In verse 22, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now, I believe that Noah was not a perfect man. Uh, he sinned. He was a sinner, just as all of us are sinners. Uh, we don't read about his sin, but that doesn't mean that he didn't sin. He didn't maybe get angry with his wife and his kids at times, uh, that he didn't do certain things. We read a little bit later on, uh, after the flood, about how he got drunk, uh, and that was certainly a sin. Um, but uh, Noah was a... Uh, he was a sinner, uh, but in all that God expected in this cooperative venture with the Lord, Noah was faithful to do what was expected of him. None of us will get to heaven and be told, you uh, were completely obedient to all of God's moral absolutes, to all his moral standards. Uh, for Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So. There is none righteous, no, not one in that sense, not by our own righteousness, by our own good works and diligence to try to keep the commandments of God. And yet what is interesting is that David, who we know, if I've recently been reading about David and really his life is filled, it's like a Shakespearean tragedy. Just all these terrible things that happen uh, in his life. He was a man who sinned and failed in many ways. Uh, he, he lied. He tried to deceive people. Uh, he was an adulterer. He was a murderer. Uh, he committed injustice at times. Uh, there was compromise in his life. And in many, many ways, uh, he showed weaknesses uh, and, uh, and errors of judgment uh, in his life. And yet still, this man had the commendation uh, of God on his life. Uh, for example, God said to Solomon in 1 Kings 9, 4, <clears throat> And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgments. And then God gives him a promise. So this is a uh, conditional promise that God has given to Solomon. But it's interesting how he talks about David in those Verses. He says, I want you to walk just as David walked before me in integrity of heart and uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded. Uh, then later we find in 1 Kings chapter 11, a couple of chapters or a few chapters uh, after the, the previous comment, <coughs> excuse me, it says, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Well, that's, I know that Solomon made some unwise choices and did some unwise things, uh, but David certainly did a number of things that were, were wrong, just flat out wrong, flat out foolish. And yet God says that his heart was perfect with the Lord is God. And then 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 7 and 8, the most amazing statement about David uh, of all of them, we find that the prophet goes and says, uh, Go tell Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes. <laughs> what a statement that is made by God about David. Thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, who followed me, with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes. Amazing. In a similar way, if we seek 
to be faithful. Yet, even though we're sinners, even though there are times when we know that we have done wrong, when we should have done things that we and we know we should have done and we didn't do them, or we uh, we shouldn't have done things and we and we did them. Uh, you know, uh, even so, if we seek to be faithful in our call of collaboration with God, we may yet hear the words that we read about in Matthew 25, 21, where God says, the Lord Jesus says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Those would be wonderful words to hear, don't you think? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Even though we're sinners. And imagine hearing the Lord say about you that you have kept my commandments and followed me with all your heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes. Wow, <laughs> it's hard to believe that the Lord would say something like that about us. And yet here is Noah, and it says that Noah did according to all that God commanded him, even though he's a sinner. That's an amazing thing. That's God's grace. And that's uh, our justification before the Lord, and that's the difference that God makes when he forgives us for our sins. He only looks upon the positive side. He only looks upon our heart for God, our faithfulness to seek to uh, to follow in the, the, the will of God uh, for uh, His glory as we seek to build a work for God. Uh, and, uh, and so He will reward us for that one day. What a wonderful thing that is. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we, we give you praise and thanks, Lord, for what we have seen uh, today, uh, Lord, in the life of Noah and how God, uh, you called him to collaborate with you uh, in the great work of rescue that took place there uh, in those days. Even though uh, no one else apart from his family responded to the preaching of Noah, uh, yet there was the uh, the great testimony, uh, there was the great act of faith where Noah responded in faith. If he didn't respond in faith, he wouldn't have built the ark. Uh, and uh, it was a it was a, a vessel uh, that called people uh, to come and be rescued from the coming judgment. And Lord, we're, we're thankful, Lord, for what we've learned today. And uh, especially, Lord, this last point about the commendation. Uh, sometimes we can be discouraged uh, when we fail and fall into sin. Uh, Lord, it can be a simple thing. It can be losing our temper. It can be uh, being critical about someone. It can be engaging in gossip or something like that. And uh, afterwards, we are ashamed at, of how we've responded or how, you know, the actions that we've, that we've taken or the words that we've spoken or whatever it is. And yet we see here that uh, there is a, there seems to be a possibility that God will overlook all of that as as our sins are forgiven, and that Lord uh, one day you'll reward us uh, for uh, following through on the things that you told us to do uh, in seeking to build a work for you, and we're thankful for that, Lord. Uh, that's a wonderful thing, and we just ask, Lord, encourage us and. And, uh, Lord, uh, challenge us as well that we might be involved in doing a great work for God, just as Noah was involved in a collaborative venture with God. Help us, Lord, to uh, take our this, collabor this call to collaboration seriously and, Lord, to be involved uh, in building a great work for God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.